everyone. My name is Vincent, and I'm a developer for TorchRL, the reinforcement learning and control library for PyTorch. So when we started this effort uh, of developing TorchRL, we had a look at the existing ecosystem of, of RL libraries that were using PyTorch. And what we realized is that some of them were heavily focused on things like production or some subfield of RL, like model base and things like that. We also acknowledge the fact that some libraries were absolutely great and used by a very wide community, but they were developed by people that had left the field and were left unmaintained. So we saw that as an opportunity for us to come up with something new with a consistent effort in developing an RL library that were using PyTorch with up -to -date, uh, that was up to date on the latest features of the library and also a library where, where users would be able basically to escalate the issues that they were, that they were encountering in RL uh, to PyTorch core and solve those issues in, uh, in the core library. So the breadth that, that we wanted to cover was basically everything that was from newcomers to skilled RL researchers, but also everything that was from running baselines to developing new algorithms with the library, which is not an easy task. The first thing that I was told when I started working on this is that people wanted a library and not a framework. So there are many ways to interpret that sentence, but one thing that immediately, immediately came to mind was that uh, people wanted to have a library that was very modular with standalone components that you could basically pick without using the whole stack of, of primitives, that the, primitives that the library was providing, but also components that you could easily swap in the algorithms you were developing. Also a library where the syntax would be totally unsurprising to RL practitioners, because sometimes what you can see is that people have renamed something into something else to suit the purpose of, the, of their library. And also we wanted to have an extended functionality, so to privilege breadth over depth, and a library entirely written in Python or almost entirely written in Python such that it was easy to hack for practitioner, practitioners. What we didn't want is to have a library that was just a collection of algorithms or just a library that was an extension of Jim, like many libraries I think are, in the sense that they provide you something on top of Jim to basically train our algorithms. Because we wanted to satisfy also users that were not using Jim, that were using other simulators or not, no simulators at all. We try to have a core dependency on PyTorch and PyTorch only, and we support many other libraries such as Jim or Jim Control or Habitat or Jumanji or Brax or whatever. We really try to integrate all of these into a unified API such that users can easily swap from one simulator to the other. Um, we try to focus on two main pillars. The first one is efficiency, and that goes along the line of everything we've talked about so far with PyTorch Core, but also um, very specific modules that are dedicated to RL, such as an efficient replay buffer that can work in distributed settings, uh, vectorized environment transforms, or advantage computations, and things like that. We also wanted, as I've said in, uh, before, to focus on modularity. So to have generic model classes uh, with very few level of, of abstractions, um, environments, modules, models, and basically all those little components that you can play around and put together into a unified algorithm. To cover spaces that were from model-based RL to model-free RL, on policy, off policy, offline, online, basically try to cover as much of the RL space as you can from the beginning. So modularity, in our opinion, comes in two flavors. The first is um, that you would like to be able to uh, swap components with each other, and the second one is that you would like basically to be able to adopt one single component without adopting the whole library. The first thing to note is that reinforcement learning is not about the media, such as in vision you have images, in text you, you have text, etc. but RL is about the algorithm. It's basically about how you're gonna have a policy that plays with the environment to collect data, what are you gonna do with this data when you pass it through your loss function, et cetera. So it's really about the interaction of all those pieces together rather than the media that you're trying to, to, to work on. And it's very difficult to come up with a unified API because, for instance, if you think about a policy, so policy in RL is something that usually reads an observation and outputs an action. 
But sometimes your policy is a little bit more complex. It's going to read an observation and, for instance, a recurrent neural network state and output an action in the next state. And also, sometimes your policy is going to return something else than an action, for instance, an action and the probability of that action. So first, you have to consider that, that your policy is something that can, really be, can, that can be really different from algorithm to algorithm. But also, your policy has to be sort of multimodal in the sense that you need to execute it in training or evaluation mode, uh, exploitation versus exploration, and all these kind of things. So basically, you, ha you have a policy that can behave in very different ways, and also that should be able to uh, digest very different kinds of information. So this is a rather loaded um, slide, but basically the core idea of, of, the, um, of the solution we found to those problems was something that we call TensorDict. And TensorDict is basically sort of a ca data carrier for TorchRL. So all the components, almost all of the components in TorchRL read and write TensorDict. And that's basically the only thing that you need to buy once you, once you start using the library. And it makes our life much easier because now, you can have, for instance, an, an, envi an environment that is not reading a specific number of features, like an action and uh, an error and state or whatever, to output a different number of outputs. You're sure that your environment is always going to read a tensor dict and output a new tensor dict. Same thing with the policy. The policy is just going to write a tensor dict and output a tensor dict. The replay buffer is going to read and write this tensor dict. So basically, a tensor dict, what, what is it? It's just a dictionary with extra tensor, tensor features that allow it to basically um, execute shape operations, such, such as reshape, view, permute, and things like that. You can stack tensor dicts very easily together. You can unbind them, split them, do many things that you would do basically with a tensor, but you can execute them on a dictionary uh, th that contains almost, uh, that contains only tensors. So first, TensorDict was part of TorchRL, and our early users were pointing to the fact that it was something that they would rather see as an independent library because they were hoping to use that in many other projects, like self-supervised learning and things like that. So we open source TensorDict as a separate library under PyTorch Labs, and you can check it out. It's, uh, it's out there, and um, yeah. Okay. Now, the second component of modularity that I was talking about is the fact that you would like to have those modules and be able to, to use just one module without using the whole stack of, of components of TorchRL. And the way we go about that is that we try to basically foresee before users ask for it to have those modules that are easily um, used across, let's say, um, experience of the, of the users. So for instance, here I have a loss that is a DQN loss. And this DQN loss, you can use it with a tensor dict if you want to use all the features that it provides. But also, a basic user that has very little experience in RL could just use it with regular tensors. And this module will take care of creating all the tensor dicts, et cetera, under the hood for you to execute the inner operations. Same thing goes with replay buffers that are highly optimized for tensor dict, but basic users that don't want to benefit from all those features, but just want the basic usage of the replay buffer can use it with tensors or even other um, Python objects. I will quickly skim over the features that TorchRL is already providing. So we have an environment uh, API that covers Jim, DeepMind Control, Habitat, Brax, and other uh, libraries. And on top of those environments, you can use transforms, and those transforms can, can be used on batch data, which makes them much faster, but also be used on device. We have vectorized environments and, uh, that, that can be executed on multiple processes and also on distributed, um, uh, distributed settings. We provide modules that have, uh, that have like common architectures that are used in RL and things like that. For data collection, we have data collectors that work in a synchronous or asynchronous manner on a single machine or multiple nodes. We have a good repair buffer API that can store data on physical storage and allows you to basically store terabytes of data when you're doing your experiments. We have some objectives like SAC, DDPG, uh, PPO, and many others that are ready to use out of the box. 
We have a trainer API that provides also a checkpointing mechanism such that you can basically be full tol tolerant or have like uh, restart your training once you, you have stopped it. We integrate various loggers such as 1DB, TensorBoard, and uh, basic CSV logging, things like that. We have various utilities. And finally, one thing I would like to point is that we have a good set of examples and tutorials in the library, and we have quite a decent documentation about how the library should be used. So feel free to check it out. Um, I have the two links here for uh, TorchRL and uh, TensorDict. So, um, yeah. Thank you.